Well, hopefully you did get the memo that today we are talking about sex. And so let me start here. For those of us that grew up in the church, especially those of you that are maybe my age or older, I'm 45, and I know people say it all the time, you don't look a day over 44. I appreciate that. Um, but I'm 45, so Gen X, and then later, the, if you grew up in the church, it wouldn't surprise me if you never heard a, a sermon on the subject of sex. It wouldn't surprise me. Uh, growing up, I never heard a sermon on the subject of sex, and so there was a lot of confusion around that subject because it just seemed like the church was kind of hands off. And if you did hear something or a sermon on the subject of sex, it was likely in youth group, and it sounded something like this. Don't do it, 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 don't do it. But when you get married, you can do it, but don't talk about it, right? Does that sound similar, right? And that's not very helpful on something that is so difficult to navigate when we live and we're walking out our salvation in a sexually charged culture, right? Because it's constantly being pressed in on us, pushed on us even. And so uh, it's just difficult. And so for the the fact that the church hasn't clearly spoken into this on a consistent basis has just led to further confusion. And if you've been coming to Trace for any amount of time, you know we've handled this subject several times and I've taken different directions on how I've preached on this particular subject. But my guess is that some of you are trying to navigate, like how do I walk out my salvation in this sexually charged culture? And so if you've kind of felt that and you felt the difficulty of that, man, I'm so incredibly thankful that you're here I'm so thankful for what the Lord has allowed me to share with you today. And we're going to hit this from a couple of different angles. And I'll talk about that here in a few moments. But I feel like I need to say something first. If you walk through those doors today with a lot of sexual baggage, any sexual baggage, if you walk through those doors today knowing that you didn't get this right, if you walked in through those doors with even some shame that's been pretty weighty on your shoulders because you've made some compromises in this area, I want to let you know there's no condemnation for you today here. Uh, I do want to let you know that as your pastor, it's my job to challenge you. It's my job to lead us and direct us and to show us what God's word so clearly defines for us. And that's what I'm going to do today. But I do want to let you know that I believe God's got something for you. Even if you feel like you've gotten this wrong for a long time, even maybe those of you in here that feel like, I'm not sure my story could be redeemed at this point, pastor, because of how far I've gone the other direction outside of God's design for this. But I promise you that there's still a purpose that God has for you, even in your sexual life. And it's never too late to step back over the line into the boundaries that he has so clearly defined for us. On that note, here's where I want to start. God wants you to have an amazing sex life. Perfect place for an amen if you want one this morning. God wants you to have an amazing sex life. Think about it. He designed it. He is the one who defined it. And because he designed it, that means he's the one that put the pleasure aspect of sex inside of it. And that's important to know because if God didn't want us to enjoy it, he wouldn't have put that in there. And I've made the joke that if pleasure wasn't a part of our sexual lives, we'd probably only have about an eighth of the world's population, right? But he did, which means he wants us to enjoy it, but within a context and within a boundary that he has set so clearly for us. And so many people don't understand this or fail to realize that one of the, not one of the, the actual first command that God gave to the very first human beings, Adam and Eve, was to actually have sex. Let me read it to you in Genesis 1, beginning in verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said, and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Now, that was the polite way and the biblical way of saying, put on some berry white and let's get it on. And for you young people that don't know what I'm talking about right now and you're single, remember that name, put it on the shelf. And when you get married, take it off the shelf, hit play, and you're welcome. Okay. <laughs> Now, as much as this is going to damper the mood, I would tell you that might be the last time that you laugh in this sermon. Out of all the directions that I could take in preaching on this topic, I wanted to honor the subject in the series that we're in called Counterfeit, which means a lot of what I'm going to communicate today will come by the way of a warning, by the way of acknowledging that too many of us, unfortunately, have bought the counterfeit version of what the culture has sold us when it comes to sex. And because of that, it's led to some baggage and some brokenness. And 
I want to remind you of the song that we sang earlier. And I love what Daisha said. I don't know if she's still in here. But we do pray that prayer probably more than any other prayer when it comes to Sunday morning. God, would you allow brokenness? Like, would you heal the brokenness in this room? Would you allow for a breakthrough to happen for the people in this room? I believe that's possible for you today. It might come with some conviction. It might come with some heavy discernment of where you're at right now and where God wants you to be. But nonetheless, I believe God's got something for each of us today. If you were to read this book from front to back, you would determine that when it comes to the purpose of sex, uh, it's threefold. And I would communicate it this way. The purpose of sex is for procreation, it's for personal connection, and it's for pleasure. But unfortunately, Satan and this culture have done an incredible job of giving us a counterfeit to this that, again, so many of us have bought into specifically by taking just one of these. And you know which one that is. But this is what Satan does. He doesn't come at us with a really clear lie that is so anti-God that we would almost back up and be like, whoa. Instead, he comes to us with some half-truths. All he's trying to do is lure us outside of God's design and purpose for our life. And so what Satan has highlighted, of course, is just the pleasure aspect of sex. Like, why wouldn't we want to participate more in something that could be so pleasurable in our lives? But what we often fail to see is the warning label. The damage that is going to be done on the other side of deviating from God's truth and boundaries when it comes to our sexual lives. And then we wonder, why do I feel so broken? Why do I feel so disconnected from God? Why do I keep ending up in relationships that are so messy and entangled and I'm not even sure how to get out of them? How did I even get into it in the first place? You see, oftentimes when we deviate from God's plan for our lives, it will lead us to places of devastation, but we fail to see the warning label on the front end of that. And you know, as well as I do, that the path of popular opinion when it comes to our culture is, man, this is just how you live. This is just what we do. This is how you participate in relationships. It's a natural part of these things. So let me just say it one more time. No matter if you're in here and you've gotten this incredibly wrong, I believe what we're going to cover today can bring you healing. I believe what we're going to cover today might set some of you on a path of freedom and away from some of the bondage that you've experienced when it comes to sexual brokenness. And my hope is that that it sets all of us up for better relationships in our future. Even for those of you that are married, maybe some of the things we covered today will even help you work on a healthier marriage. So when it comes to this idea of counterfeit sex, what do we know? We know that we all live in a culture that's heavily corrupted by Satan. If you don't, you're not paying attention. And that corruption is pressing in on us constantly, trying to convince us that sex is going to be better outside of what God and how God designed it, right? Because that's what the culture is saying. Hey, you don't need a boundary, like have it with whoever you want to, whenever you want to, however you want to, like this is what we get to participate in, like have, have at it. But that's not what God designed And therefore, that's not what he has defined. So let me explain it this way. If this were a barrier, and on this side of the barrier was living within God's purpose and will for our lives when it comes to sex. And on this side of the line is stepping over the boundary and starting to experience sex in a way that the culture is trying to sell, right? The counterfeit version of sex. Here's what we have a tendency to do as Christians at the youngest of ages. So young people, make sure you pay attention. What we do is we will tiptoe up to the line, right? I just want to peek. Like, what's on the other side? What am I missing out on? What, what's over there that maybe if I don't step too far, I'll still be okay and I can maybe step over for a little bit and then I'll step back later? And we do this even subconsciously. And then we start to justify some of this little steps that we're taking over the boundary where it's like, well, everybody else said they're watching that Netflix show when in all honesty, it's just soft porn. Fair? And we peek over and it's like, well, I'm not going to go that far. And so I'll just kind of tiptoe over. I mean, it's, it's not even like I'm going to feel bad about doing this because everybody else is talking about doing it too. And so with time, we step over and we don't know how deep we've gotten, but we get over here. And what we fail to realize, again, not seeing the warning label, over here, anything's possible. You see the culture we live in. You can do whatever you want over here. Like there are no boundaries. And even the things that God has specifically designed for thousands of years like what marriage is supposed to look like, what sexuality is supposed to look like, what gender is supposed to look like, 
And again, young people, like we've only been challenging those things for 20 years. Just let that settle in. But over here, it's all fluid. And so why should I feel convicted about this when it's like it's, it's up to interpretation? It's what any one person is going to say those things are or are not. And so I'm just going to kind of participate them in a way that I will find my own reality of what I think my sexual life should look like. And when we're over here, we begin to make decisions. And what we don't see is the decisions that we're making are leading us to some of the biggest regrets that we will ever have, causing us to put some secrets deep within the closet that we don't want to ever bring back out, right? Married couples, like, let me, let me just make a really clear example of something really quick. Don't answer this out loud, but how many of you, do, uh, you know, rhetorically speaking, How many of you, when you first got married, said, hey, can I tell you about all the sex partners that I had? What those experiences were like? Anyone? And the reason why we didn't is because we're not proud of those things. Nobody even had to tell us about that. And by the way, that's within the church and outside of the church. That would be a similar sentiment. No, 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 we don't just come and be like, hey, can I tell you about all the sex partners I had, all the sexual experiences I had before we got together, before we got married? And the reason we don't say that is because something deep within us knows that's probably not gonna be good for my marriage. And if we know that, and we know those are the things that have a tendency to resurface later when it comes to shame and guilt and past mistakes and regrets and secrets deep within our closet, shouldn't that say something about how we approach it now? Is that fair? Because I think it is. If we attempt, church, to redefine anything that God has specifically defined, it's no longer something he created, but something that we are attempting to recreate for our own sexual desires and pleasures, and we just need to be honest about it. And young people especially, like I think you know this, but you're growing up in a culture where everything has been twisted, which is why it is so important that you come back to this book as often as possible, digging in it on a daily basis, just read one chapter a day, because as you're being sold a lie in a counterfeit version of a lot of things, you need to know how God designed it and defined it from day one. This is not new from day one. A lot of the things that you're experiencing today have just been redefined in the last 20 years, some just in the last 10 years. And we think it's some kind of epiphany. No, it's deviation from what God so clearly designed. Let me tell you how God designed sex in Genesis chapter two, after he created Adam and Eve. The man said, this is, how, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. I could preach an entire sermon on that particular statement about how they had no shame and then how shame entered their life. They were naked and they felt no shame, just walking around. Uh, If you're around me for any amount of time, you've probably heard me say at some point, I believe when we get to heaven that we're all gonna be naked again. I really do. And some people are like, praise God. And others are like, I don't know how much I like heaven anymore. I don't know. What's... <laughs> the two shall become one, one flesh. This expresses the original purpose of both marriage and sex, to seal a permanent relationship between a husband and his wife. Jesus reiterates this. He actually quotes it word for word, word, for word in Matthew chapter 19. I read it at every wedding that I do. It says the exact same thing. A man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. Paul reiterates it in Ephesians chapter five. A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. You see, the physical act of sex is supposed to be our physical way of saying, I do. (laughs) Like I do. I, I, I give you like the most intimate parts of me. I do. We're physically saying, I do on top of the spiritual commitment that we're also making and the covenant that we're making with God. That's why it's supposed to exist within a marriage, which is why so many of us felt that something was off and we experienced some brokenness and we experienced some baggage when we had sex with somebody that we weren't willing to say I do with. But let me say that differently. Physically, we were saying per what the Bible teaches us, physically, we were saying I do. Spiritually and emotionally, we were saying I don't. Which is why this leads to greater amounts of friction that don't feel like they're supposed to go together. This is why this friction with time leads us to keeping these things that we experience deep within a closet. We don't want to admit that. 
especially to our future spouse. And so I'm just here today to try to help you to see because we didn't have a warning label when we were about to make that decision, when we were about to make that compromise, when we were about to say yes to that one thing, that one time, that it comes with more damage than you think it does. It just does. It's why you don't want to admit it. It's why we don't want to talk about it with our spouses. Because deep down inside of us, we know it's not what God wanted and we know it went against something that we just inherently, inherently knew was true. And so if you've ever wondered why you feel the way that you do after you've had sex with someone who you weren't planning to marry, it's because you left a part of them, a part of you with them that was only meant for your spouse. You physically said, I do, while you were spiritually and emotionally saying, I don't. Jesus said the two will become one. One God. One man, one woman, one marriage, one sex partner, one flesh, one lifetime. That was the design. So what do we do if we didn't get it right? This is where the church has not done a great job. I think we've done a decent job addressing these things over the years. But I wish what I'm about to tell you somebody would have told me when I was in high school and college. What do we do if we didn't get it right? If we've already made the compromise, if we've already done things that we, are, we truly like just feel shameful about, like I, that's not only a secret, like I would do everything in my power to make sure nobody ever gets to hear about that or to know about that. Like I, it's that much of a regret in my life. And so what do we do when we have that kind of stuff that we bring into church with us this morning? Well, what I don't want you to do is to think that there's no hope. There is always hope in Christ Jesus. There is always hope in Christ Jesus. And no matter how far and how long you deviated away from God's design for your sexual life, he can still put you back on a path of purity. He can still put you back on a healthy path because listen to me, I hope you know this about your heavenly father. He's trying to set you up for success. He's not trying to take your fun away. He's not trying to, to limit the amount of exposure that you have to things that you think are gonna bring joy into your life. No, he knows a lot better than we do what's actually going to cause the brokenness and the baggage and the secrets deep within our closets. He's trying to set us up for success, which is why he so clearly defined that boundary for us. So what do we do when we get it wrong? I want you to just let that sit. And I'm going to talk about that here in just a few moments. Based on the stats alone, it's the majority of people in this room, some form or fashion. We've brought sexual sin into our life. We've stepped over the boundary that God so clearly defined. And if I can, I'm just going to take a moment and I'm going to prophetically speak over this. This is something I felt like in the midst of my sermon writing, I think it was on Thursday, God said, hey, Aaron, I want you to say this. And so I'm going to, I'm going to say something that I wasn't planning on saying because I think God actually wants me to say this to maybe some people, maybe just one person. Some of you in here right now, whether single or married, are flirting with the idea of a fantasy right now that's going to take you outside of the boundary, boundaries of sex that God has defined for you. You're flirting with it right now. A husband flirting with the idea of an affair. A married couple flirting with the idea of bringing something else or someone else into their bedroom. Someone flirting with the idea of stepping over the line and experiencing this thing over here. And I'm just here to tell you, don't do it. Don't do it. I promise you, it will cause more damage than you think. I have more conversations than you could ever imagine in my office after somebody thought that little moment of pleasure and gratification was going to be good enough to overcome the shame and the guilt and the damage that was going to happen to their relationships and their soul for making that decision. I'm the one that has those aftermath conversations. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't even take that from me. I want you to hear the Apostle Paul, what I believe to be screaming from the top of his lungs. He says, run from sexual sin, exclamation point. Run. Which means when the opportunity is in front of you 
And it's enticing, let's be honest. There's going to be some instant pleasure, let's be honest. It's going to be fun for a few moments, let's be honest. Paul says, run! Because you don't know how this is going to resurface in your life later, but I do. Don't do it. No other sin is so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? We get this, right? This is the only body God has given us here on this earth that he wants to use for his glory. That he wants to use your mouth and his, a mouthpiece for his gospel. That he wants to use your arms and your limbs in a way to serve his kingdom. This is the one and only body. And he says, when you sin sexually, you're sinning against the very thing that, that is the primary vehicle that the Holy Spirit wants to use to bring God's kingdom from heaven to earth. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself for God bought you with a high price, the price of the life of his son. So you must honor God with your body. Some of you have participated in some things that have left you feeling shameful and maybe even unforgivable. Some of you have experienced firsthand that there are no hookups that are hook free. Some of you are here today with some sexual brokenness and baggage because of the hooks that were left in you when you thought that single just kind of at one night stand that you hooked up, no strings attached, but now it's interfering with your entire life because something just affected your soul in that experience and you can't seem to let it go. When it comes to sex outside of the way that God has designed it, there are always strings attached. I want you to remember that. There are always strings attached. And now Satan is trying to convince so many of you, even right now, even in this moment, just stay the course. Come on, you and I know what you've done. Man, those secrets that you're bringing in here today, they're deep within a closet. You pay money to make sure those things don't ever surface. Stay the course. Where Jesus is saying, it's never too late. It's never too late to surrender, yes, even your sexual life to me. Let me show you a different path. Why? Because I'm trying to set you up for success. Two of Satan's greatest lies, especially in this area, sound something like this. When being tempted, it isn't going to make that much of a difference one way or another if you go ahead and do it. So go for it. And then after you act on that temptation, it sounds more like this. It won't make any difference now if you stop. Two huge lies. Because here's what Jesus wants you to know today. This will cause more damage than you think if you do it. But if you've done it, I can still demonstrate my love and grace and forgiveness to you in such a way that you can be set free from that brokenness and that baggage. And I can put you on a new path today and what you need to hear from the top of heaven to the bottom of earth. There is no condemnation because the enemy holds you with condemnation. If you try to step back, if you try to step back over the boundaries now into God's design for this, you're still gonna be walking in condemnation and Jesus says, no, you won't. I took that for you because over here, I want you to walk in freedom, free of the guilt and the shame of every single mistake, whether sexual in nature or something different. I want you to walk free of the guilt and shame. That's why I went to a cross for you. Romans chapter eight. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Some of us simply need to admit and repent today that we bought the lie. We bought it. And the counterfeit version of sex, it was appealing, offered some pleasure, some instant gratification, and we thought, hey, we're good, we'll just step over for a little bit, and then we'll step back later. Young people, you get it, you hear it. Gotta increase that body count, baby. Holla at your boy, DM me. You still up? Send me a quick sex pic. Let's be real, the counterfeit of sex is selling us excitement, right? 
selling us instant gratification, but it will come at a greater cost than you think. I want today, when I've been praying about this sermon and what I wanted God to accomplish through this sermon, I want today to be a day for so many of you to look back on and say, that was the day that I turned it around. That was the day that I started over. What is today? The 13th, October 13th, 2024. That was the day that I started doing it differently. That was the day I started doing it within God's design. That was the day where I was able to feel the healing of God, even in my sexual brokenness. And I started to approach all future relationships in a different and a more healthy and holy way. That was the day. That's what I want this day to represent for so many of you. And what God continues to remind me of, and I'm truly like surprised by this, how God uses my voice and my words through the power of his Holy Spirit to make such a big difference because I'm like, who am, who am I? But what I've learned is that so many of us just need somebody to say this kind of stuff to us in a loving way. I didn't have that. So often we don't need to be taught something new. We just need to be reminded of what God has called us to, amen? We just need to be reminded I want to read to you one more verse that a lot of pastors like to skip over, and you'll see why really quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Or don't you know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And some of you, you hear one of those and say, oh, there's that one thing. Listen to me. You're all in that list somewhere. I am in probably three or four places. We're all in that list somewhere. But the number one reason why I wanted to read that passage is because what Paul says next And that is what some of you were. That's what some of you were. When I say, and that's what some of you, I want you to say were. And that's what some of you, and that's what some of you, and that's what some of you were. Were. Past tense. Repent. Turn around. Jesus is trying to set you up for success. He's trying to define things so clearly for you so that you will have an incredible marriage in the future, an incredible relationship. And if you're already in a marriage and some of that baggage is brought with you, brought in there with you, it's never too late. It's never too late. It's never too late to start allowing God to restore what only he can restore, to revive what only he can revive, to replenish what only he can replenish. And that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. And here's the part I don't want to say. I stand before you today not as someone who got all of this right, but someone who is willing to acknowledge where he was wrong and repent and turn around and step back over the line and start to live in the way that God designed this for me. I've often said that that decision was the second most important decision I ever made in my life. The first one was giving my life to Jesus. The second one was asking for my purity back. There was a moment in my life where I asked God to help me to redefine how I was going to move forward, walking with purity and God's purpose for me as defined by truth. And I never would have been able to marry my incredible wife if I didn't make that decision. Thank you. It does not matter how much sexual brokenness or baggage you brought into this room with you today. What matters is how you leave. What matters are the lines that you're willing to redefine today and the posture that you take as you step back over into God's purpose and design for your sexual life. Here's what I know. You will keep trying to satisfy an unhealthy sexual appetite until you submit it and surrender it to God. I want you to do that today. So many of us, when we surrender our lives to Jesus, we still keep some things on the shelf that we might want to revisit. And Jesus said, no, I want all of you. 
Maybe that's been an area for your life. You just simply have not surrendered to God. I'm asking you today to surrender your sexual life to God. God's power and forgiveness is strong enough and big enough to set you free from every failure that you've ever had in this area. Jesus Christ, you ready? Jesus Christ took a beating that ultimately brought him death so that sexual sin, among many other things, wouldn't have to break you. By his stripes, you can be healed of all of your sexual brokenness and baggage today. Whether decisions that you made intentionally or somebody that made a decision against you that you had no power over. Today is your opportunity to start over. And don't just break this chain of sexual sin and perversion for you. Break it for your children Break it for your children, generational curse. Like break it today so that one day you can speak out of experience wisdom. There was a day in October of 2024 where I started over. And let me tell you what God has taught me ever since. Speak, give yourself the opportunity to speak out of experience wisdom so that you can break that chain for your children. Make a decision today that not will only bless you, but could potentially redefine your whole family. I happen to believe that when you make a life-changing decision, it has the potential alongside of the power of the Holy Spirit to change a lineage. Yes. So what am I asking you to do? Let's get really practical. First, I want you to repent of your past and current sexual sin. Married couples, this is even for you. Because maybe you were, you know, and I get this, I've had a lot of conversations about this with married couples. It's like, hey, we're married now, we're good, it's all legal. But we never repented of all the times that it wasn't. I believe God still wants to restore aspects of your sexual life that you've never repented of because now you just think it's all good because I'm in a married married relationship. Like we all need to practice the ongoing ethics of confession and repentance. We know this, right? It's so good for our soul. And so maybe even if you're married and you messed this up long ago, I want you to repent of it today. And for the rest of us, you know what it is. Redefine the line that you will not cross moving forward. And then the last one, relearn what sex was designed for. I want today to be the day so many of you cross back over the line and you started living within the purpose that God has for your sexual life over here. But it begins with acknowledging and repenting and turning and letting God know, God, I want to do it your way moving forward. Today is the day I start. Father, uh, so many people are going to need something different from you this morning. You know that better than I do. Some people need to be reminded of your mercy and your grace and your forgiveness because some things were brought to the surface that aren't easy to deal with, that that honestly we don't want to look at again, but here they are. So God, I pray that for those that need that, you give it in abundance. Father, for those in here that are so wrestling, because it's happening, there's some people in here, it's like, do I want to do this? Do, do I really want to step over the line and try, try to do this thing in a way that just seems so weird to the culture? To, to walk a path of purity until I get married, and even in marriage, God, that we would continue to walk those paths of purity? There's couples in here right now that are dating God that both of them feel it right now. I I don't have to, I mean, it's obvious what you've communicated of what you want when it comes to our sexual lives. And so it's really going to come down to obedience. And, And for some, do we trust you? Like if what you say is true and we really do believe that you're trying to set us up for success, then why wouldn't we do it? But some of us maybe just need to acknowledge, man, I don't know if I'm living in a way that shows that I'm trusting you, God. For some, this has been such a long journey of mistakes and failures, whether it's pornography, whether it's just hooking up, whether it's crossing lines in different ways, got to pray you would help them to see that nobody is too far gone. 
Nobody is too far gone. First to be forgiven by you, but also to be set on a new path of holy purpose. So Holy Spirit, move in this room. Spend time with us in a way that we need you uniquely. Pray this in Christ's name.